Hitler's plans for Europe were far from concrete, but we can expect the entire continent to fall under their control in some way or another. But on the borders of Europe, Hitler was more willing to form alliances and grant concessions. Notably with the Arabs, who he once again believed had some German blood, saying, here and there, one meets amongst the Arabs, men with fair hair and blue eyes, their descendants of the Vandals, who occupied North Africa. But really he was just generally a fan of the Islamic religion. Like when discussing Spain, he said that the Germanic pagans were noble, but then the Muslims brought science and chivalry to Spain, and had Charles Martel not been victorious at Poitiers, then we should in all probability have been converted to Islam, that cult which glorifies heroism and which opens the seventh heaven to the bold warrior alone. Then the Germanic races would have conquered the world, Christianity alone prevented them from doing so. In 1943 Himmler tried to find passages to provide Muslims with the basis for the opinion that the Führer has already been forecast in the Quran. Ernst Kaltenbrunner couldn't find such a passage, but settled on pushing forward the narrative that the returned Isa, or Jesus, defeats the giant and Jew king Dajjal at the end of the world. One million pamphlets were produced saying things like, O oh Arabs, do you see that the time of the Dajjal has come? Do you recognise him? The fat curly-haired Jew who deceives and rules the world and who steals the land of the Arabs. O oh Arabs, do you know the servant of God? He has already appeared in the world and already turned his lance against the Dajjal and his allies. Hitler began to buy into all this saying, I'm going to become a religious figure. Soon I'll be the great chief of the Tatars. Already Arabs and Moroccans are mingling my name with their prayers. Amongst the Tatars I shall become Khan. The only thing of which I shall be incapable is to share the sheikh's mutton with them, here alluding to his vegetarianism. However, Mussolini obviously had plans to annex Arab lands. However, as the war progressed, the Nazis began to realise their mistake in siding with Italy. Hitler even said, our Italian ally hampered us almost everywhere. For example, he prevented us from employing revolutionary policies in North Africa. He also claimed that this alliance led many in the Muslim world to see Germany as another oppressor, and the Duce's claim to be regarded as the sword of Islam arouses just as much laughter today as it did before the war. So Hitler felt like he missed out on what he called a grand policy toward Islam, because of our loyalty to the Italian ally. But first I should say that the whole Middle Eastern theatre has often been ignored, although it could have been vital to the entire war. And I should say thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video. And I learned a great deal about it on Wondrium, specifically the lecture series The Middle East in the 20th Century. Here I learned of how the British in just a couple of months in 1941 invaded Syria, crushed a coup in Iraq and ultimately changed the course of the war. Wondrium however has far more for you to learn about on practically any topic you can think of. They carefully curate a collection of short and long videos, tutorials, documentaries and even travelogues. These are all thoroughly researched and presented to you in an incredibly engaging way. So essentially it's the place to go to for any curious souls. For more on this period I'd also recommend World War II up close and personal and Utopia and Terror in the 20th century which covers all of the major dictators from Stalin right the way through to Pol Pot and beyond. So really essential viewing for anyone interested in 20th century history. But again the selection is just vast, so you can really get lost for hours in their catalogues. And if you'd like to get access to this vast selection of content, so you can dip your toe into the library of information by going to wondrium.com slash jabsy or just click the link in the description to start your free trial today. I'm sure you'll be as hooked to Wondrium as I am, but for now let's get back to Germany. So we know that Italian claims in the Middle East would have gradually been ignored, and possibly three Arab allies would have emerged. The first was the Grand Mufti, who Hitler said had features which showed more than one Aryan among his ancestors, and one who may well be descended from the best Roman stock. The Mufti had been wanting to unite parts of the Arab world for decades, specifically a greater Syria. This would have included Palestine and Jordan as well, plus from his exile he was the leader of the Palestinian revolt 
against the British prior to the war. So when war broke out, he encouraged Muslims to join the Axis armies, saying the people must fight against the British and also Bolshevik Russia. And of course, another mutual enemy of theirs was the Jewish people. And the Grand Mufti said in his speech, he wanted to drive all Jews from Arab and Mohammedan countries. But then there was also King Ibn Saud, who sent diplomats to Berlin before the war and received weapons from the Nazis. One German foreign policy memo from 1938 said, Germany's policy in the Near East could be effectively supported through Saudi Arabia, the center of the Mohammedan world. Another ally though was al Gailani in Iraq. For a long time, the German ambassador Fritz Grober had encouraged Iraqi officers to turn to Germany and in 1941 they did. They launched a coup, put al Gailani in power, prompting the British to invade the country. But even though he had actually taken over a country, albeit temporarily, Ernst Vormann said the Grand Mufti still had the real power. There had never been any doubt that al Gailani was subordinate to him. And after he was removed from power by the British, he, like other leaders, remained in exile. So in 1942, Ribbentrop had a meeting and produced a memorandum named Germany's Advance Toward the Arab World. This laid out some of their plans, but central to them was their occupation of the Caucasus, specifically Tbilisi. The exiled leaders would meet there and then call upon the people to rise up against the Allied forces. They then marched south to Basra and established contact with the Japanese heading towards Ceylon. Then Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Yemen and Egypt would remain independent states and that Syria, Lebanon, Palestine and Transjordan would be united into a greater Syrian state. Independent Iraq would be allowed to annex Kuwait, while Saudi Arabia would take Aqaba, Oman and the rest of the British colonies in Arabia. So Egypt was set to be free, but Ribbentrop agreed that Italy had political primacy in Egypt. What this means is vague, but we can expect it to be sort of like British involvement in the country, with troops being stationed there and the likes. Mussolini however continued to warn Hitler about these plans, saying, I hope we do not live to regret promises you've made to the Arab leaders. You do not know them like we do. And he went on to say that the Italians had been betrayed by them in Libya. But to avoid what Vorman called the Arab game, other Nazi leaders like Hans Bola advocated for a total Arab federation, obviously under German influence. But the breakup of Arabia seems more likely. Yet, as always, more plans were on the table. Hitler still wanted to keep the French on side, so giving away Syria and Lebanon would of course go against this. And Hitler said he would not issue any proclamations on the subject until our troops were in Mosul. And on Mosul, there could have been other plans there, as Turkey remained out of Germany's influence. Here again though, his ideas on who were Aryans were odd. As I've mentioned before, he said the Kurds were Germanic, but so too was Kemal Ataturk. How that would have played out later is anybody's guess, but it seems that the Kurds would have just been abandoned to Turkish rule. Inside Turkey though, some celebrated the fact that they were later regarded as Aryan by the German leaders. An alliance with Turkey would help protect the Black Sea, which Hitler himself just called a frog pond. So Hitler hoped that the Finns cover our flanks, Turkey covers the other, that's an ideal solution for me. And he goes on about the importance of this alliance saying, the first thing to do is to conclude a treaty of friendship with Turkey and to leave it to her to guard the Dardanelles. No foreign power has any business in that part of the world. The Allies were also trying to win over Turkey, promising them parts of Syria, the Greek islands and Bulgaria. But the Germans went further. Inside Turkey there were groups looking to unite the Turkic people and even a movement called Pan-Turinism, which looked to unite people who fell under a very vague linguistic family known as Turan. The Germans allowed these groups to work within the Caucasus, hoping to start a Turkic rebellion in Azerbaijan, and maybe further afield in Central Asia, connecting with the Basmachi rebels. Plus, in some discussions with the Turks, Iraq could have been placed under their influence, and northern Syria would again be given over to them. Hitler also, after carving up Greece, took over Crete. But, he said, he did not intend to make Crete into a German strong point. The only thing he wanted there will be to maintain a centre for our strength through joy organisation. Or in other words, turn it into a bit of a holiday resort. 
Crete though could be used as a stepping stone to capture Cyprus, and given the fact Hitler didn't want any of these islands, they too could have been handed over to Turkey. Again though Mussolini did claim these islands, but they also claimed Malta and failed to act there. The Germans on the other hand did draw plans to invade Malta as part of Operation Hercules, but this never got off the ground. It seems the Italians would have taken it after the war, but the other islands were all up for grabs. Including potentially, even the Italian controlled Dodecanese Islands, which von Papen suggested giving over to Turkey after the war. But Hitler was unwilling to make any concrete promises until Turkey joined the Axis, and the most they could achieve is a non-aggression pact. Further east though, after signing a deal with the Japanese, Persia would have fallen under German influence. This was ruled over by Reza Shah, and although he declared neutrality, the Allies believed he would side with Hitler if Barbarossa was successful. Hjalmar Schacht oversaw huge investments in Iran, and it's been said that a German diplomat convinced the Shah to formally change the name of the country from Persia to Iran to reflect on their Aryan origins. The Shah was also said to be a keen admirer of Hitler, and trapped between the British and the Russians, Germany was a natural ally. There were however disagreements over racial policy, specifically the Shah believed Iranian Jews should be seen as Iranians and not Semites. But Hitler said, if there's anyone who is praying for the success of our arms, it must be the Shah of Persia. But just like with other countries, there was a debate over whether or not they were Aryans or not. But the ties between the Nazis and the Persians were still worrying enough for the Allies, who invaded and removed the Shah during the war. But we could expect a Nazi-influenced government in Iran shipping oil to Europe. Next is Afghanistan, where King Zahir Shah began to form close ties with Germany, as the Germans began to invest heavily in their industry and infrastructure. Plus, it recently came to light that the king made requests to annex land in British India should the Germans win. In 1941, the legation in Kabul sent a message to Berlin saying the king wishes the German luck in the war, and he inquired whether the German aims in Asia coincided with Afghan hopes. He stated that justice for Afghanistan would be created only when the country's frontier would be extended to the Indus. So a greater Afghanistan should have been the end of German influence. However, I'd suspect later they'd push much further, as Hitler often worried about a future war in Asia. Like he said, the present conflict is one of life or death, and to that end we are quite ready to make an alliance with the devil himself. Here he's referring to Japan, and responding to claims, our alliance with Japan is a species of betrayal of our own racial principles. And on Japan's entry into the war, he even declared it was a turning point in history. It means the loss of a whole continent, and one must regret it, for it's the white race which is the loser. Hitler even allegedly said to Ribbentrop, we have to think in terms of centuries. Sooner or later, there will have to be a showdown between the white and yellow races. This idea worried the Nazis so much that some like Erhard Wetzel began to question the idea of preventing the Russians from having children, as he said, a greater Asia and an independent India are formations that dispose over hundreds of millions of inhabitants. A German world power with 80 or 85 million Germans by contrast is numerically too weak. Others including Himmler expanded on this concept of a future when the mass of humanity of 1 to 1.5 billion lines up against us. So with this in mind, they begin to undermine the Japanese in their designated zone, starting with Tibet. This dealt with all sorts of wild ideas like the world ice theory, and their branch of thinking had its predecessors like the Thule Society and the Atlantis House in Bremen. Now with government backing, they set off to prove where Aryans came from. They went to go explore ruins in Italy and Scandinavia. They looked at the idea of Aryans being in ancient Mesopotamia. One expedition just went to go meet a Finnish witch named Miron Aku in 1935, and they went all over the world on other expeditions I'll get onto later, like for instance Antarctica. But in 1938, they sent a team to Tibet which included Ernst Schaffer. Their goal included measuring the faces of the locals to find out if they had Aryan roots, and this would allegedly prove that when Atlantis was destroyed, the Aryans moved to the tallest mountains before moving on to Germany. 
like Regent Rettin, sent a letter to Hitler referring to him as a German king and exalted lord. I am glad that you are well and your good deeds of success are crowned with success. I cherish the desire. The existing friendly relations between our two residences intensify. There weren't any large plans for moving into Tibet, but the Japanese also didn't plan to invade either. So maybe this would have been up for grabs after the war. Bhutan and Nepal were equally left out of plans by both powers, so again maybe there were some allies to be had there. Hitler did gift a Mercedes Benz to the King of Nepal and was a keen admirer of Eastern philosophy, saying, religious teaching like that of Confucius, Buddha and Muhammad offers an undeniable broad basis for the religious minded. So potentially, Bhutan and Nepal, and also Tibet, could have been brought into the German sphere of influence in the distant future. To the east though, the Nazis had been working with the Chinese long before war broke out. Advisors like von Secht and von Falkenhausen helped train up the Chinese army to crush Mao's communist forces. Plus the 80,000 troops they did help train began to goose step around this time. German aid also led to the construction of railway lines to major cities like Guizhou and major steelworks and arsenals. All this was built with a 100 million Reichsmark loan. H. H. Kung, the Chinese finance minister, visited Germany and argued that the Japanese could not be trusted. And for the Chinese, the Germans seemed like a natural ally. After all, they again had no colonies and therefore no ambitions on China itself. However, initially Hitler seemed to be happy with his choice in aligning with the Japanese over the Chinese, saying, one must be grateful to Ribbentrop in having understood the full significance of our pact with Japan. Our navy was inspired by the same state of mind, but the army would have preferred an alliance with China. General Yamashita also said that Hitler had been a fan of Japan since boyhood. He read carefully reports of Japan's victory over Russia, impressed by Japan's astonishing strength. Yet again though, as you can see, Hitler had conflicting ideas. On the one hand, he said that the Chinese and Japanese belong to ancient civilizations, and I admit freely that their past history is superior to our own. They have the right to be proud of their past. But then, as well as fearing a war with the nation power, he also said, compare the civilization of the Greeks with what Japan or China was at the same period. It's like comparing the music of Beethoven with the screeching of a cat. And he also developed the idea that some races were culture creators, some like the Jews were culture destroyers, and Japan was a culture bearer. This meant that they were able to take technology and ideas from other races, but not really able to create their own. So their alliance with Japan was one of pure convenience. Anyway, within China there were two nations essentially. Japan's puppet state led by Wang Jingwei and Chiang Kai-shek's independent China. Both of these men came from the KMT originally and this group had a far right element in it. Like in the 1930s there were the blue shirts who obviously tried to emulate the Italian fascists. Also Chiang Kai-shek's adopted son served in the German army. Chiang Kai-shek's adopted son also served in the German army Plus, Wang Jingwei continued to meet with the German Nazis until 1941. So, although Germany was willing to cede China over to Japan initially, maybe this old alliance could have been rebuilt. Plus, if Russia was to fall, this would have opened up other opportunities, like in Xinjiang. There, the Wagas had rebelled and tried to set up an Islamic East Turkestan Republic. The Japanese were busy trying to set up a puppet state there, with an old Ottoman prince on the throne. But the Soviets invaded and enforced the rule of Shen Shi Kai. So if Germany took Russia, well then Xinjiang would have been open for conquest. And given that Germany was willing to encourage some Turkic rebellions, maybe they'd have just fallen under their influence. Bey Mirza Hayit, for instance, served in the Turkestan Legion and would later write a series of books advocating for uniting Turkic states, including East Turkestan. There were already some German agents, engineers and missionaries working there in the 1930s, like George Vassal, who was hired to build railway lines by the central Chinese government, but he was arrested by the Soviets. The former ruler of the region, Jin Chu Ren, even sent some people to study in Germany, so connections between Xinjiang and Germany were made, albeit very loose connections, and nothing really major was planned. Mongolia too would also be open. 
On the Mongolians, Hitler spoke quite highly of Genghis Khan, saying he was a great organiser of men. He also said he led women and children to slaughter with premeditation and a happy heart. History sees in him solely the founder of a state. There could have been some options as to what to do with Mongolia, as many Kalmyks had joined the Nazi forces, and this resulted in their deportations to the Far East. So some ethnic Mongols were willing to enter Nazi service, despite Hitler often speaking quite badly of the Mongols. Yet Japan already had a Mongolian puppet state, so it seems more likely to fall under their influence along with Eastern Russia. However, many Germans like Kriebel didn't even believe that the Japanese could actually hold on to China from the beginning. So again, a possible alliance with China and Mongolia could have been possible in the future. Hitler also said, I don't think that the Japanese will embark on the conquest of India. They'll surely confine themselves to blockading it. So India too could well have been up for grabs. However, Hitler was far more disparaging of the Indians. For instance, India at present numbers 388 million inhabitants. The chief reason for this increase is the reduction in mortality due to the progress made by the health services. What are our doctors thinking of? Isn't it enough to vaccinate the whites? Before the war, he advised the British to shoot Gandhi and described their independence movement as a fight of lower Indian race against the superior English Nordic race. So, even though historically they believed their Aryan roots were tied to India, they believed it was long gone in the subcontinent itself by this point, as they had mixed with different races. Hitler even admitted, if we took India, the Indians would certainly not be enthusiastic, and they'd not be slow to regret the good old days of English rule. Or when discussing allowing the Indians to continue some of their traditions, like cremations by the river, he said, the Indians can think themselves lucky that we do not rule India. We should make their lives a misery. This is largely because he would just ban any of that sort of stuff. Then, as I've mentioned before, he seemed impressed by British rule in India and feared that the Russians could move in if Britain fell. Within India, there were a couple of movements for independence focused around leaders like Nehru, Bose and Gandhi. Bose was open to siding with the Axis and met with the Japanese and Germans during the war. Hitler even claimed, Nehru has been eclipsed by Bose. Nehru's fate will be like that of the socialists in 1918, who was swept away by the masses. Here he's referring to the German socialists who revolted after World War I. But he also said that the Indians would try any form of government, including Bolshevism, to get rid of the English. Nobody cares about the state of anarchy that will follow in India upon the departure of the English. Some, like Ribbentrop, supported calling for Indian independence, and an Indian bureau was established to aid in this. But even Bose realised waiting for real German assistance would have been a waste of time, so he went to meet with the Japanese. There was a unit of volunteers in the German army, but Hitler had no real love for it. Saying, the Indian Legion is a joke. There are Indians that can't kill a louse, and would be prepared to allow themselves to be devoured. They certainly aren't going to kill any Englishmen. So what would have happened to India is pretty much guesswork. It seems that in Hitler's ideal world, he'd have been happy to make a pact with the British and allowed them to keep hold of it. He often said things like, it might be possible to negotiate a separate peace which would leave India to England. Failing that, the Japanese could have moved in and the subcontinent would have been divided with Germany or Afghanistan taking what would become Pakistan. So it would have been partitioned almost along the same lines as it would later be partitioned by the British. As for Southeast Asia, Hitler was again unhappy with Japan's advances. What is happening in the Far East is happening by no will of mine. For years I never stopped telling all the English I met that they'd lose the Far East if they entered into a war in Europe. The Japanese are occupying all the islands one after the other. They will get hold of Australia too. The white race will disappear from those regions. Obviously here the Japanese were taking away Dutch colonies like Indonesia, British Malaya and French Indochina. Musert, a Dutch Nazi, said to Hitler, three centuries of effort are going up in smoke as European rule was, in just a couple of years, ending. Himmler, however, wasn't too fussed about this, as he was, as always, more concerned over race, saying, in this way the Dutch people will maintain its integrity, whereas before it was running the risk of corrupting itself with Malayan blood. So he was happy to see all the white people leave Asia. 
No plans were made to move into the region regardless, but Hitler was unhappy to just hand them over. Maybe this would have been a future battlefield, as the Germans would try to reclaim the former European colonies. Plus, control over places like Singapore would give him a route further east. Also, he mentioned Australia before, and this should have been in Japan's fear. But the Japanese again made no real plans to invade. As for German plans, I found a paper in 1939 called the Mercury Paper, which reportedly uncovered Nazi plans to occupy the island. This may well have been a complete fabrication, but it states a former Nazi named Paul Grisar revealed to them Italian and German partition plans with allegedly Japanese agreement. Queensland, with its great number of Italian settlements, together with New South Wales and North Australia, is intended to come to Italy, with Sydney as capital. Victoria and South Australia, where the greatest number of German farmers live, would be taken by Germany. Japan should, according to this agreement, keep her hands off Australia. Again though, there's no real proof of this plan elsewhere, so it could have just been made up. Inside Australia though, there were some small groups, like the Australia First Party, which included the daughter of the suffragette, Emmeline Pankhurst. They advocated for independence from Britain, and an alliance with the Axis. This, however, was particularly small. There was also the Centre Party, led by Eric Campbell, which even had its own small paramilitary, the New Guard. They wanted to remain united with the British, but never got more than 1% in the elections. Nevertheless, if Britain fell, maybe an alliance with a right-wing group would have been possible, like the United Australian Party, which is the predecessor of the Liberal Party in the country. Although this was just centre-right, they were vehemently anti-communist, and one future Prime Minister, Robert Menzies, travelled to fascist Europe and said, Abandonment by the Germans of individual liberty and of the easy and pleasant things of life has something rather magnificent about it. They have erected the state, with Hitler as its head, into a sort of religion which produces spiritual exaltation that one cannot but admire. Plus, after the war, many war criminals were able to find a home there, like Victor Padani and Laszlo Magay. Magay actually became head of the Liberals' Migrant Advisory Council. Plus, given Australia's long-held fear of an Asian power rising, it seems likely they'd choose Germany over Japan as an ally. After all, Yellow Peril played a prominent role in Australian politics for decades, and they adopted a white Australia policy. Even during World War II, Prime Minister John Curtin said, This country shall remain forever the home of the descendants of those people who came here in peace in order to establish in the South Seas an outpost of the British race. This is in response to many people complaining about the number of Asian immigrants entering the country. Then going back to the end of World War I, the Australians rejected Japan's request for racial equality. Then Prime Minister Billy Hughes said, 95 out of 100 Australians rejected the very idea of equality. So, in the event of Britain falling, maybe Australia would just fall under Axis influence. In nearby New Zealand, Campbell Begg formed the New Zealand Legion, but this wasn't necessarily as fascist as the name would suggest. After all, after Begg met with some Nazi officials, he described their whole philosophy as absurd. Hitler, on the other hand, described the Maori of New Zealand like animals, saying, where does the boundary between the lowest New Zealand native, the bushman, the tree climber, and the ape lie? Where practically is the boundary here? This, by the way, was brought up while discussing the extinction and extermination of weaker species. Then, way back in 1925, he said, for example, many New Zealanders live in trees, and many still climb around on all fours. So, had the Germans arrived in the country, we could probably expect mass killings. But how, or if they'd even get there, would just be guesswork. However, there could well, as always, have been another plan. Goebbels wrote in his diary, The Japanese have come so close to Australia. It has ever been the territorial aspiration of Tokyo to possess this fifth continent as territory for emigration. Therefore, Australia, and probably New Zealand, would become Japanese. However, Goebbels later wrote of German conquests in Russia that their chief task was finding people to fill it up. That is the question that the Japanese too are facing. To conquer Australia won't be hard, but to fill up Australia will be a difficult task. The English didn't succeed, and that's why they are going to lose Australia. 
so there could well have been a sort of population transfer, with Anglo-Saxons from Australia sent to inhabit conquered eastern territories in Europe, and the Japanese would therefore be free to settle in Australia and New Zealand. But again, all guesswork. Neither Germany nor Japan had clear plans there. However, in the Pacific and beyond, there were some attempts to claim back former German colonies. 